What's up, everybody? Welcome to Tesla Fix. Today, we have another very special topic, like I always introduce, because, of course, yeah, the stock is tumbling again. It goes up, it goes down. What's happening? Is Tesla still on the right path? I mean, we've heard it again and again. Elon getting political all the time. We've recently had a huge interview with Don Lemon. This was also very interesting to watch, to say the least. Uh, it was a pretty strange interview, in my opinion, especially the question from Don Lemon. But needless to say, going away from that, I want to focus on the core again like we did with Alexandra Mertz and I want to focus here in this episode on the core of Tesla. Is Tesla still performing good? Does the stock price actually make sense right now? Is it okay that Tesla is at 170, 160 around that ballpark? Should it be less? We have to look into that with a very special person that I've looked uh, forward to interviewing here on my channel. So let's see who it is. Welcome to Tesla Fix. Make sure to subscribe and like this episode. Oh, Dylan Loomis is here, actually. Way <laughs> glad to have you on here. Finally, it's super difficult to get him on, of course, because <laughs> he has this pesky YouTube channel he has to run all the time. And of course, this is a lot of work. Uh, so I'm super glad that you're here, Dylan, and uh, looking forward to, to this interview here. Likewise, brother. Appreciate you having me on. And yeah, I've been looking forward to this as well. It'll be fun. Yeah. So you've you've also followed of course you followed the news of Tesla and of Elon Musk and uh, every every Musk company. So uh what would you say is Tesla still performing good do you think the the stock price is uh, justified because maybe for the audience here it's interesting your background that you had before your channel even uh maybe you can tell the audience a little bit what's your background why I ask you that question especially and why we are focusing on the stock and the Tesla story here. Um, yeah, maybe you can dive into that a little bit before we start. Yeah, yep, for sure. So uh, I was a financial advisor for about four years with Edward Jones, managed just over about $70 million for families and really enjoyed it, but just ultimately knew I was called to something else. And I did a few other things in between, worked at a few startups doing social media and actually worked for a legacy automotive company at a dealership for like three weeks, got to learn the ins and outs, but I quit very soon after I realized what it really entailed. And then, yeah, long story short, started a channel talking about Tesla. Been a huge Tesla Elon fan for over a decade now and just always loved the technology. And so started the channel, it kind of took off and then it morphed into daily Tesla and electric vehicle news. So But my background is definitely finance and economics. That's what I went to school for at Penn State University Park here in the States. So that's what I still keep up with. I actually was very close to opening up a hedge fund with a subscriber of mine doing some trading. Ooh, nice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother long story. But uh, yeah, so that's my background. And to answer your question about Tesla stock, I guess just to kind of touch on it, I think it's so important for our culture now to be able to zoom out and see the bigger picture with social media. It's we're so zoomed into the weeds on this daily news flow because it really is all about clicks and money and getting people's attention. It's an attention economy yeah. that we live in. So from an investor standpoint, you have to be able to zoom out and see the five year trends, the 10 year trends. This is what investing actually is. Anything shorter, in my opinion, than five to seven years is actually more like trading. You know, gambling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. One and the same. People call it, you know, day trading and they think it has to be same day, but investing investing is a long term. And I think to give people context, so Tesla has been a public company now for 14 full years since they went public. If I were to ask how many of those years do you think Tesla closed in the red, I would give your audience a chance to think about it. There's only been two years. Two out of 14 times has Tesla stock been red for the full year. That means wow. the other 12 have been positive. Not a bad return. And yes, so far this year we're in the red, but we still have over half of the year left to see how it plays out. So my point there is with Tesla stock, yes, there may be some feelings that it hasn't done much for a long time, but still we've only had those two red years. I think it was 2022 and 2016. All of the rest have been green. So even if this year ends up as a red year, it's almost like we're due because nothing, not Bitcoin, no asset goes up monotonically straight into the right. That's just how the markets work. It's how it's always worked. So, you know, again, being able to zoom out and view it from a, you know, five, seven, 10 year perspective, I think that'll really help a lot of people because, 
yeah, it's just easy to get sucked into the day-to-day news flow and what everybody's saying. And you also really have to understand everybody's perspectives. There's people talking about Tesla stock that are traders. There's people that are short Tesla stock. There's people that own it like fund managers and just one name, Gary Black, who I really respect, but we just have to understand he owns a fund. He, he has a fiduciary responsibility for his fund to perform every year. So he doesn't have the luxury of just saying, hey, I'm going to let it ride for five or 10 years and I don't really care what happens because he has clients that are asking at the end of every year, what's going on with your portfolio? Because he's trying to beat the market, right? So yeah, I mean, I think people just have to kind of keep that perspective in mind. And that's my quick intro to me and (laughs) Tesla stock. (laughs) And finally. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I I think it's also important to note that um, many people also write in the comments all the time, also in my comments here, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, pump, 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 and pump the stock. It's actually not about pumping the stock. It's about uh, viewing Tesla from a neutral perspective, actually, to look at it. And of course, um, I think it's also important to note here that this is in no means <laughs> financial advice. This disclaimer is very important. And I think um, it's interesting for me, at least, to see it because I interview those people, many, many people from the Tesla community as well as from, from other uh, also niches uh, as well. And I kind of see that did something change? Did the company really fundamentally change their plans? Of course, growth is dampened a little bit now. We have strange economic things happening globally right now, of course, because of all the wars and everything. So it isn't yeah, it's 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 always a, a interesting time, and I still think that that when you look at the core, I think looking at the core is so important because that's so funny. Uh, when I, I think the stock always emotionally charges those those kinds of discussions and the views on on something, even if oh Elon Musk said something, oh my God, now Tesla is failing. No, they're they're not failing, uh, and that's what I want to focus also on this episode to really look into it because. I think it's, it's sometimes it's so heated. It's so interesting to see it. I think you can cl- clarify many, many, many things because you have all those news cycles in your mm-hmm. head, kind of, more or less. I hope, <laughs> of course. And uh, yeah, and I think that's that's important to see. Do do you see any fundamental change in the business? I mean, uh, maybe you can say something about the growth trajectory that Tesla was on, and now I mean this fifty percent growth target per year. We're so used to that, almost like. This is so easy to achieve. And so like casually we say, ah, 50% growth per year, easy. But <laughs> yeah, is it easy? Uh, is it necessary to have 50% growth all, all year, every year? Uh, or, or how do you view it? Yeah, it's a great question. So first I would say there has actually been a fundamental change, but it's not with Tesla, the company, it's with the macro space. And that's another thing everybody needs to understand is that the macro drives everything. That is the first driver of the stock market up and down. So we had a perfect storm back around 2020. Every, everything happened for Tesla in this beautiful way. We had 0% interest rates. We had quantitative easing. We had Tesla turn profitable. So those three things all were the reason that Tesla had its pretty historic run back around 2020. Then now we have pretty much the opposite. We have higher interest rates than we've had in decades. We have quantitative tightening, which has been taking place. So for people that don't don't know, it's basically quantitative easing. There's more liquidity being placed into the market, more money flowing around. Quantitative Mm -hmm. tightening is when they pull that money out of the system. So less money to go around, less money liquid, less money to be in stocks. Then you pair that with the Tesla aspect where we have Tesla's growth slowing. They're, we're in this in-between wave for Tesla growth. Their earnings have been coming down. Wall Street's been cutting their earnings expectations for the next 12 years. So it went from the perfect storm in a good way to a, the perfect storm in a bad way. So to your question about 50% growth for Tesla, I think we should have known that not, again nothing can grow 50% forever you know there there was always going to come a time when you're not going to grow from 10 million a year to 20 million a year you know it's just the math doesn't make sense and the factories required however again if you're just able to zoom out and look past maybe the next 12 months during this period of slowdown with tesla deliveries and maybe they should have you know had the next gen ready instead before the Cybertruck to keep that 50% growth for longer, 
But the silver lining here is that, yes, there's still a ton of growth ahead with the next gen platform, with Tesla Energy. Then, of course, you have FSD and Optimus. But even just from a vehicle perspective, Tesla has a history of executing. They have the best talent in the world. So this next gen platform that should hopefully be, you know, between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. Again, they've proven they can do it. They have they laid out their plan of how they're going to do it. So what I'm trying to say is that in this season right now, it's almost like Tesla is coiling like a spring or like a slinky, right? The more it gets mm -hmm. compressed mm -hmm. and the longer it compresses, the bigger it's going to be able to shoot up essentially in the future. So there are certainly things that have to happen. But when you just look at the roadmap, they have the most exciting roadmap, arguably, of, you know, any company out there. Um, so, but it just takes time, right? It takes time for them to develop these next gen production lines, time for Cybertruck to scale up, time for more mega pack factories to come on. But addressing the t the TAM, the total addressable market for all of their business lines, it's a it's absurd. So, what I would say, if you look at that and you really can't see future growth from Tesla, then I really don't know what to tell you because it's plain as day. It's just going to take time to get there, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, what do you think the most important thing would be, the, uh, or what will be the biggest growth factor, in your opinion, from yeah. those segments? Or maybe you can list those segments. I mean, what do we have? I, the car business, of course. And Yeah, another good question. I think long term, the biggest one is certainly going to be in the AI realm. So it would be Optimus and full self-driving. So version 12.3, I don't know if your audience has been watching mm. the videos, but it really does seem like the probably the first one that I would call a breakthrough. It's so much more human-like. It is not perfect yet. It has work to do. But from a pace of innovation standpoint, this should really be the one since there's no humans that have to actually write the heuristic code, the manual code. It's just the cameras take in the video data, it's sent through the neural nets, and then it outputs essentially human-like behavior. So it's going to be able to iterate much faster. So that's one, and I don't think I really need to touch too much on why having a vehicle that can drive itself is going to mean massive things for Tesla's market cap. So that's a big one. It'll totally transform transportation. You know, it's, it's really that simple. And with that, it's going to be, you can almost copy and paste it to other places in the world. Now, there are some different rules in certain places and regulations that have to fall into place. So it's not going to be as easy as I'm making it sound, but it's not at all like the competition that uses LIDAR and radar and all these different sensors that are more expensive. And they have to have perfect maps of the world. But then if there's construction or the world changes, then they have to readjust and do all of that. But Tesla, with its cameras and its brain, it just learns, it, right? It doesn't need to adjust or remap or do any of that. So they definitely have a big competitive edge there. And I think it's true to say they're closer than they've ever been. So I think the next 12 to 24 months are going to be really exciting for that. When it comes to Optimus, That's obviously a huge call option for Tesla. Personally, I'm not getting too excited for it yet. I just think there's a long way to go for it to prove that it can do real useful work uh, in the real world consistently and reliably. But the progress, again, that they've been making has been really impressive over just the last three or so years. But the one thing nobody ever really, some people talk about it, but they don't get excited about because it's not necessarily a consumer facing product is Tesla's mega pack. Their energy business, yep. the margins are already greater than the car business. They only have one factory that's not fully ramped yet. They're, they're going to have five to 10 of these bad boys here in the future. And they're building the second one in Shanghai. I'd imagine the third one would be somewhere over in the EU. But mm -hmm. this is another business, again, that like the Powerwall is a consumer product, but the Mega Pack is mostly for utilities or any other company, really. Um, so I think Investors don't get as excited about it, understandably so. The software side of that, auto bidder for the ancillary services yeah. and energy arbitrage is confusing for a lot of people. And so I think they just kind of, you know, maybe don't pay as much attention. But this is really has the potential, even this year, like we're talking over yeah. the next three to four quarters to really hold up Tesla's operating margin, its gross margin while the auto business is in this lull and pullback period thanks to interest rates and you know maybe 
you can argue whatever you want about what they've done with price cuts and all of that. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, those are just a few, a few of the big ones out there, you know? Yeah. I I think the mega packs you've, you've touched on that, uh, beautifully, I think uh, is so important because, um, this will save energy grids actually, or, or, uh, energy providers, uh, a lot of money because that if you stabilize the grid, I mean, those peak peaker plants or however they are called, I think peaker plants is the German mm-hmm. word here, uh, that, yeah, they, they are mostly gas powered, for example, or, or, um, neutral, neutr- uh, natural gas powered, uh, and yeah, they are polluting a lot and they are easy to start, but not so easy to, to stop again. So these, for example, could be replaced um, at some point. And uh, I also think it's such an advantage to produce cars with batteries. And even if the yeah demand for cars goes lower in the next years, then they could harness more batteries for or have more more uh, uh, yeah yields for the for the mega packs actually so they can just put them into a different packaging and sell the same battery to a different uh, customer base where they have 30% margins on their uh, yeah on their mega packs i th- also agree that the mega pack factory is a is a big deal and, and just uh, want- not to cut you off, but just to share no, like one cool. example for your audience of why it's really proof that Tesla does have a competitive advantage with the mega pack. So a chart came out the other day talking about um, how much revenue these battery energy storage projects in the Texas market were earning. So Texas or Tesla has one project. It's called Gambit. It was the number one project in terms of revenue for 2023 out of 80 different projects. So I think the average across those 80 projects was about $196,000 in revenue per megawatt. Tesla was up around $300,000 per megawatt. So of course, the size of the project is going to play a role in that data. But the point is with Tesla and their auto bidder software, they really are, you know, (laughs) above the competition. And that's uh, just one market. But so it's not like they're just a player. They're like one of the mm-hmm. players. I think globally they have around a 15 or 20% market share in that battery energy storage. Again, with one factory that's not fully ramped. So <laughs> Okay, that's crazy. You know, it's, it's like there's yeah, the good things is, coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's uh, crazy. I think um, what's also interesting, I I've, I've, uh, have a tweet here that uh, or surfaced again, um, which I found very interesting it was from the investor day again uh, talking about the macroeconomics here um i think that makes a lot of sense i'm gonna share my screen here for one second um because i think this highlights it beautifully what what's happening um and elon di- I, i mean it's not surprising that uh, he already talked about this uh, what will the economy moves in can cycle. you hear this uh, mm-hmm. yeah. and we've had a very long period of up cycle uh, the next 12 months will be i think difficult for everyone. And I, I think, uh, you know, when uh, Berkshire Hathaway had their uh, annual meeting, uh, Warren and Charlie actually said, like, hey, this, this year, the, the Berkshire companies are going to make less money. Um, and so, and, you know, they're, they're, they're very well-run organizations. Um, and I think that's just generally true for the economy. So, you know, but, but, if, but, 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 but the it's also important to remember that you know there there are good times and, and there are dark times, but then the good times follow the dark times. So um, my advice would be: don't look at the markets for the next 12 months. <laughs> if if there's a dip, buy the dip, <laughs> um, and I, I think you will not be sorry because the, 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 you know the, the, there's just generally a sort of a there's an economic cycle to things, but things come back up. So um, my guess is tough times for a year. Like, like I said, just, just, just my guess. Uh, and, and, but then Tesla will emerge stronger than ever. Um, and the, the long term, if you say like net present value of future cash flows will be incredible in my opinion. All right. Yeah, I think uh, this sums it up. Pretty good. What do you think about his comments on the Investor Day uh, from, from last year? 
Yeah, I'm really glad that he said that because it's turning out to be very true. You know, and I've said before that most investors, they'd be better off not paying attention, not maybe not most, but there's some that are struggling and maybe get too sucked mm -hmm. into the day to day stuff. They'd be better served just not paying attention, like for two to three years, just letting it be and living their life, enjoying time with their family, whatever they like to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, it's true. You know, we're in this time where I think a lot of it has to do with expectations. People came into Tesla maybe after that historic run thinking it's just going to keep going up without mm -hmm. understanding that auto is a cyclical business. And yes, Tesla energy is becoming a bigger part of the story, but Tesla still derives about 90% of its revenue and profits from the auto business. So again, it's just, you can't build these mega pack factories overnight. It takes time to scale them up and to establish the supply chain. And it does take a while for these projects to actually come online. So Tesla can sell them, but they don't actually get paid until there's certain milestones that are hit, being connected to the grid, actually, you know, beginning to operate. So again, I just think it's such hmm. an opportunity. I wish more people could see this as like the, the chance of a lifetime, right? When you go shopping, you don't want to go buy a new car or clothes or shoes when it's like, the highest price you want to buy it when it's on sale is it should be the same for an investment so if you really trust in the company's future which personally i do and i think that's rooted in incredible evidence you you it's okay to like i hate to say root for because i know people experience pain when the stock price goes down yeah. but again like it's an opportunity right and so you're acquiring the same company actually a much better company than a few years ago at lower prices and for me sign me up for that 10 days out of 10 you know again no financial advice no, yeah. <laughs> have to, yeah yeah it's always uh, it's uh, of course uh, sometimes you have to remind people uh, that this, uh, yeah we're not advising here anything but i think it's uh, important sure. to 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 look at it it's just opinions um, i i view it the same way because for me as well uh, it's interesting when you compare it with the competition when you just look if you want to look just on onto the car business i mean maybe you can talk about the competition uh and we can go through them i think uh, the germ german oems of course for me are something i'm i'm uh, peeking at uh, or, or looking at pretty pretty closely keeping track of the german uh, car manufacturers but maybe we can just go go through them and and uh, look a little bit onto them uh, what what do you see with with the overall ev market i mean it's it, yeah kind of dipped <laughs> yeah yeah it's funny there's uh, been a lot of talk of bloodbath lately for united states things in the political realm trump said something about that referring to the yeah. auto industry and it got blown out of proportion but it really is kind of a bloodbath already for the auto industry starting with the united states essentially every single automaker has pulled back outside of tesla and i'm trying to think if there's anybody else maybe polestar polestar also said they're just going to keep their prices high and be a luxury player they're kind of giving up on trying to be a volume manufacturer but the big ones you know ford gm they've all pulled back billions of dollars of ev investment and They haven't, they're not even close to turning a profit. They've had endless delays and software issues. And they ha they keep making these promises that they're going to bring these vehicles to market and they, they're not coming. And then these problems are being compounded because the dealers are waiting for these vehicles and they're being told to spend millions of dollars to get ready for EVs. But then these legacy OEMs aren't providing the EVs to sell. And it's just a really messy situation. And of course, the dealers don't want to sell EVs because as an employee, you're not going to want to learn an entirely new car and drivetrain and powertrain and take all the time to do that. Then those cars aren't even going to be able to bring in the same level of profits because they don't need as much service. So it's just a really broken model. And again, it is all relative. So like Tesla's competition, in my eyes, it's really just the Chinese. And I think that's one of the bigger stories in the auto market. And I say this on my channel all the time, but they're the threat. Like if they, if those cars find their way to the United States in the next five years, which I think they will through the, through Mexico, mm -hmm. because we have that free trade agreement, that could be the action, the beginning of the real end for some of these legacy automakers if they don't figure mm -hmm. things out in the next three years. So it's going to be really fun to watch. But look, you can say whatever you want about, uh, you know, the Chinese and 
and all of that and their methods. But at the end of the day, when it comes to just looking at the products, what they've done is pretty incredible. Like they have a huge hold on the entire battery supply chain. And it's a, it's a real thing that needs to be talked about and discussed for the United States and our reliance on them. And the IRA has done a lot to bring investment here. But, you know, as we're seeing now, we don't have a lot of battery talent in the United States. You know, these companies that are trying to build these battery factories are struggling to find qualified people to actually, you know, spool up these factories. And then people are complaining that they don't want any Chinese companies technology here, like Ford and CATL, their battery factories face a ton of pushback. And that's not the only one It's happening in many different places. So there's just so many interesting storylines going on. And you know, I don't have all the answers for how it's going to play out. But from a competitive standpoint, China is incredible. The, the pace at which they are releasing new vehicles that are cheaper than the prior version is crazy. Usually when a company announces a new product, it's more expensive, right? NVIDIA just announces a new chip. It's going to be more expensive than the outgoing ones. Not mm-hmm. with the Chinese car companies. They they release new cars that are cheaper than the previous ones. So yeah, it's pretty impressive to see. And uh you know, their, their global move is, is, has begun, you know, they're rolling out in Europe. And so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I'd be curious how you think about some of the German companies. Cause I have my opinion, but yours might be more informed than mine. Yeah. But I would, I would love to hear yours uh, at first and then we can just dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think they'll figure it out. I mean, I really respect what they've done. They have such a great like legacy and heritage. So I'm not one to just kind of write them off because I don't think that's wise. But, you know, I, I haven't been necessarily a fan of all of their designs. But I do think a lot of these first EVs from the legacy OEMs, they've been some have, you know, found some traction, but it's really almost like a test or it's not really a prototype, but it's a run through to kind of get a product to the market, see how your audience responds, work through some of the new software, the new supply chain that you're going to have to establish. So I've been waiting for the next gen of vehicles, right? Like Mercedes is going to have a next gen and BMW is working on the new class. And so this is really going to tell us who's going to be for real in the new EV world and who is going to fade off and maybe either be acquired or merge with somebody else or just turn into be a small niche player. So again, in the next two to three years, we're going to learn a lot about these companies. And um, there have been signs of hope, you know, when it comes to, I'm still a sucker for interior, like the Mercedes interior. And, you know, I love Tesla. I like the minimal thing, but the lighting and there's certain, It's just not everybody wants a Tesla and we need, we all need to understand that Tesla may have the best software and the best safety, but there's just people that want what companies like BMW and Mercedes offer and they love the brand. And so I really hope they can keep getting better because the more the merrier competition is always good for the consumer. So, yeah, I think um, it's, it's interesting <clears throat> with the G- German companies. It's uh, very an interesting topic to to dive into because um, the legacy of German car, especially Mercedes, Daimler, uh, Daimler Benz, and Mercedes, and uh, yeah, however you want to call it, it all has the same DNA and heritage. It's it's the car was invented here, and the interesting thing is they have a legacy of 100 years internal combustion engine technology. They also had an electric uh, version pretty early on, of course, uh, but. They never followed through. Um, uh, also, oil was getting bigger and bigger. Uh, also, with the diesel um, engines of the of the, for example, the trains and everything. And so, so diesel was important. Uh, fuel was important. Uh, oil was getting bigger and bigger. So they just kept going with with this technology. And it's interesting to see now that all the patents, all the innovation lays lies in the internal combustion engine, and. Of course, they don't want to give that up. That's that's one of the big things. But the problem here is that if it is the <coughs> superior technology in the in the long run, when the because you can argue that oh yeah, the battery tech is too expensive and stuff like this. Yes, until it isn't anymore because we adapted. The same goes for the smartphone battery. Do you uh, how do you, how much do you think like a smartphone battery would cost when you would time travel back? Uh, th- this would be incredible that you have such uh, high voltages inside of a co- uh, inside of a device and also uh, shrink shrink a computer down to a 
wrist sized uh, Apple Watch, for example, you you can really see that um, when when companies focus on one core product globally, then how fast uh, I think Elon also talked about that how fast the innovation will go up. And now we are witnessing the same with electric cars. And the problem now is that everybody kind of can make a car now. It's it's not exclusive anymore to to go with the German tech. And the interesting thing is that, of course, they don't want that. They want hybrids. They, they want to extend the internal combustion engine technology as far as they can because it's just a cost thing. And mm -hmm. that's <coughs> why they claim everything. And that's why I'm highly skeptical so in, in comparison to your opinion here. I found it very interesting that you still have hope because for <laughs> me, I'm so dis disillusioned here uh, because I'm so near to these uh, companies. Also, what I'm hearing from engineers, engineering friends, um, for me, that Mercedes, for example, just, yeah, went with Geely with the smart one. It's, it's normal that they do joint ventures sometimes for new product categories or to optimize. And then most of the times they buy the startup up or, or the company they work for or buy more shares of the company. That's also a strategy they do. But for me, that is a warning sign that Mercedes, despite having a good uh, good engineers there, uh, that they rely on the Chinese tech as well, and they, yeah, they, that's not their expertise, not their field, and uh, it's interesting to see. I've heard, I'm, I'm not sure, I have to still confirm this. I, I looked into it, but I've heard that uh, the EQ line will be also developed with Geely together now, uh, something like this. I'm not sure. Take this with a grain of salt, but. Um, I think the reliance on Chinese manufacturer will be bigger and bigger. What's your opinion also on that, that, that the, the battery tech actually is Chinese or, or um, for example, also South Korean, like Sam Samsung also has a huge uh, battery division and, and Panasonic and all the Japanese uh, um, companies also are very huge in that game. That's the core technology of EV. So, Yeah, how do you view that uh, to, to get it? Uh, what's the strategy to get it here? I, I don't know. Yeah, to yeah. Germany, it's Fair thought. I think to start, some of these companies need to start somewhere. So they're going to need a few years to develop their own batteries if they do, their own software if they do, to get those supply chains set up. So they should have done this a long time ago, but they haven't, and there's reasons for that. But I think a lot of these you know, deals or partnerships, they'll be a bridge, ideally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'll just g give them time to figure things out on their own. Like VW just announced their partnership with Mobileye, but they, whether they're saving face or making a, you know, corporate speak, they said, long term, we're still going to rely on our own in-house full stack for autonomy and, you know, advanced driving features. Time will tell, right? We don't know. I, I definitely have my doubts uh, when it comes to that because it is yeah. such a difficult problem to solve. And if you're not going all in on your own technology, then you're probably just going to rely on somebody else. But here's the thing: like, I think a lot of the luxury manufacturers, you know, let's call it above fifty, sixty thousand dollars, I think they'll be able to at least survive uh, up in that higher price range working with other partners because costs of all of these things are coming down pretty quick. Chips, batteries, uh, a lot of the things in the supply chain, the price of lithium, and it's it's going to fluctuate, right? But I do think there's a world where maybe they are going to be better served in their market to use somebody else's in-car software, you know, whether it's Apple CarPlay or Android Auto or a, a new Chinese software. So they can actually focus on what they do well, which is, you know, the design and the engineering and the powertrain and uh, these things. So, again, I need your audience to know I am definitely an optimist. So <laughs> I mm -hmm. always try to Me see too. the best <laughs> in people and companies. And I do like I want all of us humans to have a, a bunch of options, EVs. Of like course, yeah. it's better for Tesla. It's going to keep them Absolutely. on their toes. And if everybody else just fades into the abyss and Tesla's the only, Tesla and BYD are the only ones making cars at scale. Like that's not really that fun for consumers. And yeah, it's, I don't it's, think at that some point, happen. why should they try? Yeah. Why, why should they try harder uh, at some point? They, they right? kind of uh, monopolies are never good. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just think at the end of the day, it's really tough because if you think about just from an incentive standpoint, you have these CEOs at these, whether it's German or any legacy car company, they maybe have another 5, 10, 15 years before they were planning to retire. All of a sudden, Elon Musk comes comes in and blows up their entire business model. A hundred years of precedent, a hundred years of supply yep. chain. They're making their profits comfortably every few years. They just release a new product. They're cruising. Everything's good. And then everything gets blown up. So now they have to decide, again, are we just going to milk these profits until I retire? Because I don't want to be the one in charge of this company when we lose mm. billions of dollars trying to sell EVs against Tesla that's been doing it for 10 plus years. Or am I just going to push the hybrids and push the ice? And we'll talk publicly about all we're going to do with EVs. But in the, like, in the quiet thing that nobody says, well, we're just going to kick the can down the road until the next person and they can take over that problem. So, yeah, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I just think for the companies that want to survive and figure it out, they'll, th this might just be a bridge. And hopefully they're working hard and trying to hire top talent to to do things on their own, but they need to offer something now. You know, they don't want to have nothing out there. So we'll see. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, due to the fact that also the company cultures are so differently um, in the car business itself. That also, I think, uh, is there in the in the mindset of the american companies because of course german companies and american companies differ quite a lot uh, in in company culture um we don't have the ceo model that he the ceo can decide like a dictator more or less we are very egalitarian so so people are elected into this position but they ha like the board has a close eye on them if anything isn't like we saw with these he was sought off uh, because of that because it was too verbal about the negatives and that drives the stock price as well so they didn't like that and uh, the Porsche P family has a big 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 legacy with Porsche and uh, owning VW uh, the Porsche group uh, owns VW so it's Yeah, it's <laughs> the Porsche P family actually has a huge say in everything. So this mm -hmm. is also a thing that doesn't uh, shouts, uh, let's say, agility in the market <laughs> that is heavily competitive now. And um, I also think it's such an advantage that Tesla has this software DNA because, yeah, guess why? Uh, design thinking ideation methods weren't invented in Germany. There's a reason for that because it's not possible to to do those things. And also with uh, the red tape bureaucracy that we have here in Europe or in Germany especially and kind of Germany influences Europe very much because it's one of the st strongest countries here as well as France and those two countries kind of hold it uh, in firm hands, more or less, the European Union. In the 90s, I always talk about this on my channel as well, 1995, um, many software startups actually developed here as well, and, and many, many tried uh, different, different things and everything. And the state, Germany, immediately tried to tax the software and didn't let the market develop, actually. And what happened, most of the companies just went straight to the U.S., To Silicon Valley. And mm -hmm. that's where the big brain drain was in the 90, 1995. Now we still have the software issues we are having right now. And uh, yeah, that's that's a big, big deal, actually. And uh, you know, that's why <coughs> VW has problems with Carriot and stuff like this, because we have a brain drain here. Everybody who's good in programming walks away. Do you know why out. they tried to tax it so much? Or like, were they trying to stifle that no. development or <laughs> no, they just wanted that, the money? No. Yeah, that's how, how government here works. They they immediately want to tax everything. This is such a big deal for them. So it's not uh, uh, yeah too friendly for, for uh, new startups and stuff like this. That's why mm -hmm. also like um, venture capitalists is, isn't, that, that's not a system that because they the state always wants to get a hold, a grip of the taxes immediately. And uh, so you cannot even develop a company and test things. That's why... Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of stifled there, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of the reasons. Uh, what are your thoughts on on this? That that this could be also the culture uh, problem there. Yeah, well, speaking of the culture at Tesla, I mean, I think I don't know how much your audience knows about it. You mentioned Agile, but it is really such a stark contrast to everybody else. I mean, just simply put, like Tesla can make changes and have new parts in a vehicle within a week. You know, they. 
all of the teams work together. There isn't this, you know, hierarchy. They're all on the same level and they different people from different uh, divisions can work together and they're empowered to solve problems and yep. and to take risks. And they're almost encouraged to fail so that they can learn and keep innovating quickly. Whereas the same change for a legacy company literally might take years, you know, just the way they have to go through the homologation process. Like I heard Tesla, I forget uh, exactly like the data, but um, effectively they can have these new parts homologated almost autonomously, again, within a matter of weeks. And the homologation is basically the approval process. So Tesla can have all of these new changes and have them approved basically on the fly. Whereas again, it could take years for another company. So that just plays out in the background over a long period of time. And then you look at all the technology in the Cybertruck with the 48 volts and the steer by wire. And, yep. you know, hopefully those eventually trickle down to other Tesla vehicles as well, which I think they will. Um, but really like Tesla's future growth, you know, that's kind of the theme of this video. It really is going to be planted at least until Optimus or FSD hit on this next gen platform. And I think if you want to talk about risk to Tesla, of course, the key man risk with Elon is one if, you know, God forbid something were to happen to him. And then the next gen platform, if they were to go too crazy with the design and make it too polarizing, you know, that could maybe limit them from doing 5 million sales a year, which eventually is the goal. But, um, like, I just don't think people are really ready for what is potentially coming in the next two to three years, if not sooner. Um, you know, think about it. If Tesla has a vehicle selling for $25,000 that qualifies for a $7,500 tax credit that gets 250 miles of range that might be able to drive itself 95% of the time, like this is people just aren't ready, you know? And I, I think it's, <laughs> that's true. I almost like all the people getting shaken out of Tesla and all the people complaining and crying about it. And look, I understand I, I do have empathy for people that are maybe over leveraged mm. in Tesla, but use this as a lesson, right? Like you have to be prepared for whatever in the stock market, but to everybody that holds firm and keeps their conviction in the company and knows it inside and out and just, you know, it takes time to try to understand what's really going on here. They, not financial advice, but I'm very confident they will be rewarded sometime in the next three to five mm -hmm. years. And it's just going to be a really exciting time to see that happen. And because so we've talked about it for so long and so long. And again, we're it's coming. It's right around the corner. It's almost like a like a, a broken record. <laughs> so, so, yeah. yeah, it's 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 interesting to see. But uh, what what gets gets you most excited about Tesla um, in that? in that regard from the technology space or, or even, yeah, even what they are developing the energy side or the bot or what, what's, what's the most uh, interesting thing for you personally? Yeah. So selfishly, this might be, uh, not what they're expecting, but so we just got a model Y, um, a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago and my wife and I are currently sharing it cause we both work from home. We drive like six miles a week, uh, <laughs> but we've wanted a Tesla for a long time. And so the plan is probably for me to end up getting a model three, maybe later this year. So I'm really excited for the model three ludicrous. Uh, that's what we're calling it right now. Um, so like I've been watching that very closely. I have some hope that that might qualify for a tax credit. And so we'll see. Um, but yeah, just like that's just my because I might look to buy one later this year. Yeah. Um, but from a tech perspective, ah, gosh, it's such a good question because there really are so many things. I mean, I don't want to default to just full self-driving because the reason I'm excited about that there's so many people that don't have autonomy now, whether for whatever reason, being able for like it, just the elderly population, one example, to give them the ability to like maybe press a button and a car comes yeah. and picks them up and, and takes them somewhere like that's such such a cool thing. And then, of course, you have all the business uh, cases where people like a normal person could go and get a loan and buy a couple vehicles and start a fleet in their local town to do yeah to give people rides that can't maybe afford a car or not have, not all of these countries have public transportation. Like at least where I live there, <laughs> it's not great. Um, so that's cool. But, and then, yeah, Optimus is like a whole nother conversation. There's so much to talk about there. Um, 
like I said, the progress has been pretty special. And <laughs> you talk about unlimited total addressable market, but that's just when I'm trying to keep my expectations low because I don't want to get wrapped mm. into, you know, mm. uh, too much hype because there's already people modeling like millions of bots a year. And there's yep. just so many things that have to happen between now and then. But um, yeah, so it's like, I don't really have just one. I'm, I am really excited about the Model Y refresh. Like mm -hmm. we would probably trade in our Model Y because again, I'm a sucker for the interior. So just selfishly, I <laughs> want the interior lighting and I want the quieter cabin and uh, the upgraded sound system. Like those are the things that I'm just most excited for, not just as a Tesla investor. Yeah, I, I, I get it why I also think the new Model 3 refresh is a beautiful car because I own one. I bought I one. I saw actually. that. I'm jealous. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, it, it was so, yeah, it's it's such a such a great vehicle because I talked about Tesla so, for so many years and um, thought about the company and everything, but I actually never really used their core product, which is the car, of course. And I've, I have I knew like the functionality and everything. I've talked about this on my channel as well a couple of times, but experiencing the product, especially the this refined product, because I know that there were a lot of hiccups and if I wouldn't have bought the, the let's say, uh, uh, panel gap gate uh, because we Germans we look closely on these panel gaps this is unacceptable and we mm -hmm. I, i cannot accept it and yeah so it, it was a total culture shock for me actually to get in it's my first ev and it's model three and it's a refresh one so um it's it's interesting to see how much they developed and i've did it test a review that i will be posting i still have to edit it it's in for two months now but mm -hmm. uh yeah it's 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 such a step up, especially with the noise reduction in the cabin. That was totally noticeable. And we are now being in a very German c category, uh, let's say, it, uh, that um, when Germans like this car, that's a good thing uh, mm -hmm. because they are very picky because they are used to a lot of quality. Of course, many German OEMs also cheapened out over the years especially also mercedes which was actually interesting to see everything is plastic now and if you touch it it cr creaks and stuff like this it's mm -hmm. not as built as it was like we still have a big brand perception that uh, mercedes is such a high quality uh, company yeah. it, it is true they the panel gaps are always superb and overall it's it's a good quality product but i think that's not exclusive to to german oems anymore um, And uh, also the Chinese are pretty good because they, many German brands went to China to produce their cars. And of course, the Chinese learned how to do that. And now they can implement that in their car factories as well. So uh, how do you see that uh, with the quality? I think that's also an interesting point there that, uh, yeah, that, that this development is happening because the U.S. has a special, I, I think it's interesting to see the differences in also, the view on quality is so different. Uh, the Germans are so focused on the detail, but missing mm -hmm. out the, the, the whole functionality of the car with all their buttons. I think it's interesting to, to see this. <laughs> uh, Before opinion? I share my thoughts, is there anything you don't like about the new Model 3? I'm curious. Mm, only one thing, but that's just a software issue. Uh, imagine this scenario. Um, I have the key on my phone as Bluetooth key. So, so with a normal, um, yeah, how is it? A mobile phone key. My wife also has that. I went into a store and she had her mobile phone still with her. She was in the front. My kid was in the back. I went because she had a confirmation SMS on her phone. I picked her phone, took it to the store and panic mode enabled. Mm. Yeah, everything closed up. And it thought, oh, yeah, somebody's breaking into your car. And it's funny and all that Elon thought it's funny to play rock music 100% loudness. But when your kid is in the back, it's actually pretty shocking. And uh, so sure. this one is a huge, huge flaw to, I think that's a general Tesla software issue kind of because this kind of scenario can happen. That's something you have to keep in mind. You have to put it into camp mode or, or uh, also the, the stock mode or this animal, was it dog mode? Dog think, mode. Or? Yeah, dog mode. That's mm. also that. That's how you disable the panic mode. Uh, but mm. yeah, that that one was horrible. So this is the only flaw I had. But that's a software issue. That's also with Model Y, I think, and everything. So overall, yeah. I I don't see 
actually anything negative on the Model 3, also that the, the stocks are missing. So mm -hmm. I, I got used to that so fast and uh, having also the automatic um, gear shift that you just press on the brake and it decides where to drive. It, it works 90% of the time and mm -hmm. you still have to look, okay, which gear am I? That's important to note here. It's still beta. Yeah. So, but so, so overall, I'm super amazed by the car. And of course, my culture shock is extreme because I went from ice to a Model 3 Highland, so <laughs> that's, that's yeah. a big one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, to answer your question about quality, so Tesla's gotten so much better. I mean, my goodness, and with each new factory, that's a whole nother thing because they started with Fremont, which was a gas and ice factory, you know, and they did the best with what they could there, but with each new iteration, they just keep getting better and better, and they talked about that micron-level precision for the Cybertruck, and There have been some early issues like MKBHD had a big panel yeah. gap on the truck he was using, but Elon chimed in saying they already fixed it. The service fix is pretty easy. And again, anytime any company releases such, so much new technology in a vehicle, there's going to be challenges. There's, there's going to be hiccups. That's why I always say I'm not going to be the first early adopter of any of Tesla's products. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to give them three to six months at least to work out all the new kinks and because I just... I'd rather wait, you know, I, that's fine. But salute to the early adopters because the world needs those people. To, somebody needs to buy those first cars off the line. So uh, that's great. Um, but yeah, when it comes to quality, Tesla is, again, when it comes to talent and hiring, they are actually, they just had a new job posting for, I forget exactly what it was called, but it's to continually limit the service that Tesla customers actually need. Mm -hmm. So they're always studying and doing extra testing to figure out, okay, because they're, and it's, it goes back to what you talked about. It's because their cars are software connected. They have all of this data that they can pull from their customers, what they're yep. using, what they're not using more connected than any other car that I know of. That's why they have more OTA functionality. Like Cars from three, four, five years ago with Hardware 3 are now getting yeah. the new yeah. version of FSD. That's crazy. Like, mm -hmm. such a cool thing and so overrated, I think most people don't really understand. But yeah, because their cars are software connected, even from a service aspect, they can see, all right, what's going wrong the most? What, Where are our problems? And with their own, Tesla also has their own enterprise software. You know, most companies use SAP or one of yep. these other off-the-shelf versions, which you can customize, but Tesla went ahead and built their own. It was called Warp Drive was the name of their project. So that, again, gives them their own custom tailored software where they can see what's going on in real time and then they can use that data to get better. And again, it just it doesn't happen overnight. You know, t Tesla, relatively speaking, they don't have a hundred year experience manufacturing cars mm -hmm. like these other companies. They have what, 13, 14 years, maybe. Um, if you go from when the Roadster started production, which I think was like 2008, that's like, you know, 15, 16 years. So there's still a new company when it comes to production. Um, but I think given that time, again, zooming out, see the bigger picture, they've made so much progress and our Model Y is excellent build quality. Ours is from Texas. So Haven't heard very many problems about cars coming from there, and um, we'll see where their next factory ends up. But yeah, they just keep getting so much better with time. And so I do think it's time to start changing the narrative about the quality because I have seen mm -hmm. videos of some of these, uh, what you know, German or uh, cars that are supposed to be the best build quality, and maybe they're trying to save money. Who knows what the rationale is? But mm -hmm. the conversations should be changing, I think, for sure. Yeah, especially it's, I, I think that's the halo effect or the halo effect from the past of their brand, that they have the brand perception. German cars are super good, made in Germany, it's always the best, but it's it's not kind of not true anymore, especially with the Chinese being so, so damn good in quality control. And uh, also, like, when the factories are modern, if economies of scale hit, Then we see, like like you said, the early adopters might have problems, but Tesla will know about it. Uh, maybe they address it. Like with the MKBHE case, there was something loose. Loose the screws to hold the the door in place was uh, didn't wasn't the right torque or something like this. They, I've seen the statement. So mm -hmm. yeah, something like this will be addressed, and 
guess what? The 100,000 Cybertruck will be pretty good, I would say, <laughs> and uh, pretty yeah. flawless. So, uh, yeah, when economies of scale hit, then then we see more and more improvements. But it's also, like you said, it's, it's uh, due to the factory, how m modern the factory is, how the processes are. Mm -hmm. And um, to get into this micron precision level, uh, like they said uh, for the for the cyber truck, yeah. So it's an interesting thought with with the quality. I also agree. Um, do you think that that brand the brand will save the legacy car manufacturers because that's w one of the key things they have. They have the brand, but I mean, it's about execution and the product, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So how do you view that? Yeah, uh, their brand can only take them so far. I think they're going to get one chance. I think they're their customers will maybe buy one more Ford, one more uh, GM vehicle. And if it doesn't meet their expectations and they're it, from in the EV world, I don't know too many people who are that brand loyal that are willing to pay a price for a product that either they don't fully love or that has software problems or that they mm. all is being recalled when they can go get a Tesla or maybe in the future, a Chinese vehicle that might cost less, that might have better software, that might be more reliable. I just think at the end of the day, most customers are going to want the best product at the best price. So brand can, again, serve as a bridge and maybe give them one more chance as we transition to EVs. But I think that brand uh, value can only go so far. Um, but again, like customers, they want different choices and not everybody yep. likes the Tesla design. And so somebody else has to step up. And again, I think GM and Ford, both they're, they're working on their next gen EV. So we'll probably, we'll probably be waiting a couple of years for Ford, but this is the year for GM, like the next 12 to 24 months with their Altium platform. Now is the time their executive just said that they think they're working their past their uh, Altium production issues. So it's time to show up. They've been talking about this for years, you know, and we'll see what they what they bring to market. Yeah. Any thoughts on Rivian? I think that's also very interesting because Rivian, hence being a small startup, smaller startup, let's say, um, but the design team, I think, in my opinion, coming from a designer, I, I really like what they're doing. I, I like uh, the approach they are doing. They are having very clever designs, especially with... With for the, they really have the customer in mind. Um, for example, with the folding seats that are flat, also the front seats for camping, for example, it just makes totally sense. Uh, even having a smaller form factor now, with mm -hmm. the R three and the R two and the R two S, right? W was it this way? I, I always mix them up. They have the R two is coming up, and then they have the R three and then the R three X is yeah, like the that, performance. I always mix the them up. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. hard. So to keep the R three is the smaller one, right? Uh, yes. Exactly. What What's your thoughts on, on Rivian? So talk about a great brand. Rivian has a very good brand. They have a loyal audience. They have a special niche. They have really, I love their R1T and their R1S. I haven't had the chance to drive them, but I've watched a ton of videos and tried to, you know, familiarize myself as best as I can. I will say though, I'm a little bit worried that they're rushing to the mass market too soon. So mm -hmm. with these next gen vehicles, it, look on paper, it sounds great. The specs looked good, but these are just hopes and expectations. We're, we're two years away probably from production of these vehicles and the vehicles they're selling now for $80,000, they're losing about $45,000 on every one. So how are they going to go from selling at 80K, losing 45K to then selling at 45k to make money like they're gonna have to bring out a huge amount of like costs we're talking you know seventy thousand dollars plus of costs they need to remove for this next gen platform to become profitable they have a little bit of cash you know and i think they'd be able to raise money if they need to because you know the brand is there and there's a, a roadmap to to figuring it out but all of these companies we can't really talk about them being here for the long term until they can prove they can make a car profitably and Rivian's cash flow the cash burn has been the worst of any of these pure EV startups I think Tesla from a cumulative cash flow loss standpoint the lowest Tesla ever got was between like six and eight billion Rivian's already at I think around like negative 19 billion dollars when it comes to cumul cumulative cash flow so they're one of the worst they're even worse than Lucid 
Lucid is losing more per vehicle, but their cash flow is a little different. So, <laughs> but but Lucid loses most of their profits on their CEO. I would say. Yeah, <laughs> man. Oh, in this compensation dude. package, four hundred million or something. It's such so ridiculous. The lower <laughs> Lucid stock goes, the higher his compensation goes. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of how it works. That's his, his comp package, and no it's, judge there to to take it away from him. Ever. Right? It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> um. So yeah, but with Rivian, like. I'm torn because again, I think they have a great product and I, I'm really rooting for them. You know, I like RJ and they had some things where they were stealing some Tesla talent and got into it a little bit, but that's normal. It's just competition. And so uh, we'll see what they can do. But yeah, I just, all of their, the pricing and the timeline, I'm adding a year and I'm adding, you know, a couple thousand dollars because pretty much every single company, they'll announce a product. It's going to be like, the optimal, right? But when it comes to actually bringing something to market and with time and inflation and all of that, usually the vehicles come to market a little priced a little higher. The range is a little lower, you know? And so we'll see what they can actually deliver. And people have to remember that this, the stats sound good on paper now, but that's going to be compared to the Model Y two years from now. That car could be much cheaper, much better, you know, in certain regards. So Tesla's a moving target, as we always say. So I don't know. You know, I think they definitely have a chance, probably the best chance of being a the pure EV player behind Tesla and, and America. But again, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, Dylan, you've uh, kind of uh, touched on very interesting points in this episode already. So I think we kind of ended here on, on this note uh, that Rivian might, might prevail. And uh, we hope, of course, that uh, we have competition that Tesla w won't share its monopoly with, with BYD or something like this. So, uh, yeah. But uh, for the end of the episode, do you have any closing thoughts or also something you are working on? Maybe you want to um, maybe share with my audience uh, or, yeah. So something that's up with you. Yeah, well, first, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hopefully, you know, everybody watching, you got a little something from this. I've enjoyed chatting with you and hopefully I'll be back <laughs> in the future. Um, but yeah, to any Tesla stockholder, I would just say, you know, hang in there. It, it is true. It's usually darkest right before the dawn. And um, I think the usually you have to go through some hard times before you get to the success. And it's really uh, so much in life is just not about, it, it's just keep showing up, you know, not giving up and keeping the faith, whatever cliche saying you want to say. Um, similar is true in the stock market. And when it comes to Tesla, I just think patience will be rewarded and yeah, just hang in there, you know, and do what you can to stay afloat for the next, however long it takes one, two, three years. But, um, There's so many incredibly exciting, world-changing things that Tesla's working on. And just go replay that clip that Jan played earlier of Elon. <laughs> yeah. Play that to yourself every morning and night if you need to until <laughs> we get to the other side of this because it's coming. So, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, thanks, Dylan. So everybody who is not subscribed to Dylan, but I assume everybody who watches my channel is at least subscribed to, to Dylan. So the three people that are not subscribed, please go over to Dylan and subscribe to his channel. No, I really think you, you're doing a great job with your channel. I have watched it very early on and I Thank really you. enjoyed your, your insights. You're doing a great job. And since Rob sadly stopped, uh, Rob Maurer uh, sadly stopped his podcast, you should go to D Dylan as well because he's a great replacement I think uh, he's he's you're doing such a great job uh, summarizing everything and also a big big source for me as well to get info and you're very fast also with information you're working hard you can really tell sometimes I'm like oh okay I, I have new information maybe I put out a video oh Dylan already did it <laughs> it's, it's, you're so fast that's that's pretty good so props to that uh, and Thank yeah you. Thank you very much for, for being on, Dylan. Yeah, and my pleasure. And anybody that's watching that is not subscribed to you, Jan, hit that subscribe <laughs> button now, like the video. These little things help creators so much and like 10% of true. people actually like the video. So if you're still here, you better be liking the video for this man. Your channel is criminally underrated. You have some awesome <laughs> conversations on here. So Thanks. again, just keep showing up and yeah, you'll keep growing for sure. Thanks. All right, Dylan, uh, there's only one last thing to say now to the audience, and that's a goodbye, everybody. Wasn't this episode awesome? Let's accelerate the pace of innovation by subscribing to Tesla FX. This is my absolute favorite channel on the whole interwebs.